um, by a sort of toxic internal culture and we're so internally focused and um, how can we try and get out from these binaries that are destroying the left between leave remain between different age cohorts between different parts of the electoral landscape if you live in urban or university towns versus traditional red wall seats and to look at some of the you know attempts that we could make to forge a more transcendent politics to get out of these binaries and try and forge a, a, a politics that heals and reunites these different communities. And I think you can start that by rebuilding a politics of work. This is very difficult for the left because increasingly we're beholden to a new socialist imagination which self-identifies as a post-work left that says through automation and the march of the robots, labour physical labor is um, in decline, that the working class is on the wrong side of history, and consequently the left should rebuild around a new progressive base amongst urban educated networked youth. Uh, a, a change in the left which is occurring without ever it being debated, so I thought that was worth debating it and contesting some of the assumptions around it and some of the evidence around the end of work, and that work is inherently um, lacks any dignity rather than a contested space that needs to be um, entered into rather than ran away from and forge a new politics of work. And the third element was the enduring productivity challenges we face as a country where since the economic collapse um, and the economic crash, flatlining productivity has meant declining incomes for many of our fellow citizens because uh, the cost of living is rising faster than um, wages and Consequently, I think that in turn propels some of the more right wing forces in British politics, but means that we've got to answer the future of work in any debate around rebuilding our economic capacity as a country. So there was these three sort of crises linked into the pandemic, all of which I think should return attention to questions of work and work quality and the role of work and labour how we understand labour as an economic and social category, not as, as a Labour Party, but in a wider political discussion. And what is the history and purpose of the left itself? So all of these things are thrown in and I just make an argument not to, um, which is to try and have an argument around some of these things, which are, we're, we're sort of swerving around. And I think that that partly accounts for our diminishment as a political force. And unless we recorrect that and get into some of these arguments, my fear is we're, we're on the wrong side of a lot of these forces which are eating away at Labour as a national political entity. And I fear for where the direction of the party is. And unless we get in and debate some of these things and rebuild the sentiment of Labour as a political party, I fear for our future. So um, that's a slightly long-winded answer um, which just throws a lot of issues in, but it was more out of a fear and a, uh, a worry about the future of the party, really. That was the real driving force about it, so as to kick a few tables over and kick up a bit of dust and have a bit of an argument, really. That was basically the impulse behind it. Um, well, you summed it up quite well there. If anyone who's read it, it, it's very easy to read, which I found quite good as someone who is new to holding events like this. But there's, there's one thing you mention a lot in the book. It's returned to an ide idea, ide ideology or politics of belonging, of communities, of places where people work for each other almost. But many on our side of the political world will also find a lot of your sentiments, perhaps reactionary, perhaps nativist. How do you think you combat that as someone who is so outspoken and stuff like this. I am. Um, many years ago, I stood for the, when John Prescott stood down, I stood for the deputy leadership of the party um, as, a, as an attempt to contest the direction of New Labour. And I was attacked from the right of the party by bringing up all these issues of class and identity and a fear that we were fermenting the forces that would build the far right, not least because in my island borough, we we were on the front line and contesting the BNP because we had 12 BNP councillors on Buck and the Dagenham Council. The critique came from the right of the party. Um, 
for being too left wing. Now the criticism is that's still there, but there is also criticism on the left that this is nativist and reactionary. Ten years ago, it was seen as radical and uh, controversial from the right. So if you stand still, these arguments come and reappear and in different forms. Um, look, the charge there is a there is a charge that goes something like this. The working class, the traditional working class, and what I mean by traditional is a traditional relationship to the means of production in the classic sense of the use of people's capacity to work and how it's commodified and used under capitalism. That's what I understand the traditional working class to mean. But now, in huge sections of the left, the word traditional is instead re redeployed as a, as, a, as a nativist term to suggest that you're pandering to some sort of reactionary racist impulses amongst a white constituency that you write off. One, they're on the wrong side of history because of economics. B, ethically, they are wrong. And third, you should not in any way um, bow down to it. Now, having fought the BNP all my life in East London, that is not something that is usually seems I'm usually criticised for because we've taken them on literally physically on the streets for a long, long time. It's not about pandering to them. It's about rebuilding an argument in the left about our relationship to the traditional working class in terms of their relationship to the means of production. We're under new labor. We've written off some of these debates because of our assumptions around technological change, where we assume that, the, and this is repeated in the Corbyn left and what was once the hallmark of the Blair left, was that we assume that the working class is on the wrong side of history. So it gets us out from under the difficult relationship we've had over the last 25 years with our traditional base. So what we do is we write it off. We assume for a certain deterministic assumptions that it's disappeared. So therefore we can successfully under new labor camp out in middle England and, and not have to contest how we rebuild the work and the character of our traditional working class communities, the communities we were created to represent. And under the Corbyn left, this is now seen in a more fashionable sense as um, embracing an agenda called post-capitalism or luxury communism or whatever you want to call it. Now, I see that Blairite element and the Corbyn element as very similar in that they both succumb to forms of technological determinism, which is a sort of get out of jail card for being unable and be unwilling to represent working class communities and working class people. And instead you go all in on different elements of a progressive politics. Now, look, let me put this quite bluntly. It might well be the case, and I actually probably think it probably is, that this train's left the station, right? By stealth, the working class, sorry, the Labour Party is becoming a very different party to the party I joined and on behalf of the community I represent, right? 76, 77% of our membership are from social classes ABC1, primarily in the South East and in London. Increasingly, our voter base comes from that same demographic and we're declining amongst C2DE. The Conservative Party have 26% lead amongst working class voters right that's the latest polling i saw now some will see this as a sign of success on the part of labor in terms of changing its base i see it as a classic indictment of labor and a failure to uphold its traditions its memory and its uh, historic character i fear that this debate has gone without us ever debating it i'm afraid and it and it's sort of occurred and we've become a different party than what we were even a decade ago, definitely what we were two decades ago. And we've never really debated it. And now the only game in town is to double down around certain sections of the electorate, to give up on the red wall, double down on fighting the blue wall, um, go all in on certain forms of identity as the currency of politics rather than class. As that's how I would always understand the driver of politics. And, um, you know, see that our new electoral landscape lies in the urban communities and amongst our university towns. Well, good luck with that, because I don't think there's a winning coalition there, one. And B, I don't think that is the purpose of Labour traditionally. Now, this is not to say I want to play on a different part of the pitch. I just want to get away from these binaries where you have to have this false choice. And you have to rebuild a wide and deep coalition. Biden, I think, is a very interesting 
antidote to a lot of this thinking. From He's come from nowhere and he's thrown, shown great agility and creativity in trying to rebuild an alliance between the traditional Rust Belt or the traditional base of the Democrats and the more progressive flanks on the East and West Coast. He's doing it by a new politics of work where he's talking about creating 18 million jobs, unionised jobs, jobs you can raise your family on, and he's aligning the jobs agenda with the environment agenda. And that is the join for me. So the solution is not to celebrate the end of work and uh, double down on a new electoral base, but to rebuild a wider and deeper coalition. And to do that, we have to have an argument about the direction of travel in the modern Labour Party. And that's what I'm sort of trying to do, really, um, because I think the clock's ticking. And I, th and I think I'd, unless we put the jump leads on this pretty quickly, then I think we could be in deeper trouble. But the trouble, the, the final point I'll make is the danger of this, let's call it the technological determinism, which is a hallmark of the left historically, and the demographic determinism, a lot of this thinking whereby even when we lose, we win because our base is younger and it's going to be around for longer and all of this, you know. So there's always, in every defeat, there's a victory. Well, for my constituents, there is no victories here, you know. There's no, you know, they, they can't afford this sort of indulgence of just waiting for these demographic and technological laws to play out. We have to um, win now. We have to rebuild as a matter of um, um, moral urgency, actually. You mentioned this moral urgency. Um, as someone who, who grew up in um, a South Birmingham Labour seat and now lives in a very leafy Bristol Labour seat, I understand how where you're coming from. How do you think we can reconcile that traditional working class base in that type of city in the Midlands and the North with our new academic network youths, as you called it yourself, uh, in places like Bristol, in suburban London? Well, these, these are very big questions, but I'm, I'm, I, I use, I pray and aid the example of Biden. Um, what he's doing in terms of his, he, he, he is self-identifying as the FDR of the 30s. And there's a lot of talk in the UK now about a Keynesian stimulus to create jobs. Um, he's talking about these 18 million, his jobs plan, his family plan, his community plan, big fiscal stimulus. But I think you can go much further than that, you see. It's not just about Keynesian reflation, it's about the FDR of the 40s rather than the 30s, who was trying to embed economic and constitutional rights for all citizens. And I would go much farther than just saying we're going to create X number of jobs and just say we're going to enshrine now the right to work for all of our citizens, the right to free housing, education, um, the right to security, the right lot to live in a degraded planet. And these set out as this new bill of rights that are constitutional guarantees for all of our citizens and reorder the whole agenda of government to deliver on these things. I think um, Angela Rayner is starting to do that. You're hearing what she's talking about in terms of work since her, her promotion, I think we call it. Um, I was most taken with Andy Burnham on the uh, day he was re-elected as mayor of Manchester when he got up and he said, um, my job is to provide dignified work, help provide dignified work for every citizen in Greater Manchester. Now, there's a very simple phrase, right? It has real potency. It's very simple, but I think it's quite deep in terms of a new covenant with people about what, is, which is beyond a contract. It's covenantal in terms of its rebuilding of a social relationship, connection with people. I think you can link it to uh, deeper ecological concerns across the electorate, where you rewire in terms of jobs, environment, and a new pluralism across the party and a political culture around your movement, which builds alliances between other social and progressive forces and labor, and links in this question of pluralism, the environment and work as the three sort of um, pillars of a new sort of politics. Now, it's very difficult for labor because it's not a pluralist culture. It doesn't like aligning with forms of nationalism, environmentalism, liberalism. I think that's inevitable, what's, given what's happening across the UK. So I'm in favour of a progressive alliance of sorts. Um, I would see the cornerstone of it being a new politics of work.
what is, I repeat, difficult there, where a lot of the new fashionable left self-identify as the post-work left. Now, if you do that, I find that very difficult in connecting with people in terms of what I understand people want for their life. Um, if you look through all the evidence, a lot of the evidence from political philosophy as well as survey data, people desire meaningful, purposeful, dignified work as central to their sense of identity, their sense of community. Um, and maybe we should start with the evidence we know of in terms of how people wish to live their lives. I think that can create a transcendent form of politics that gets out of this false choice, this you're either remain leave, you're either urban networked youth or red wall. Look, these communities are much more complicated than these simplistic stereotypes perceive them to be. My constituency would be seen as a bellwether traditional red wall seat for Dagenham, Fordism, the history of the British working class made in Dagenham, all of this. Actually, it's a much more complicated seat than that. The working class are much more complicated than this stylized notion of the red wall. You know, it mean much more nuance and thought in terms of how you weave together such a coalition, but it is possible. And that's why, I mean, I started, I, this, this was finished just bef before Biden came to power uh, and I wouldn't have seen him a slightly elderly, gaff-prone, centrist as a, a guy who can show a way here, but he's shown quite creativity in this in terms of we should, he's shown us the way it can be done. It's not beyond our collective wit to do this, you know, and there's some good evidence around him. So give, give example, the mayor uh, across Wales, they set up this Good Work Commission, which they're going to enact now, and it's a really interesting piece of work. Um, so around, in terms of some of the nations and regions of the UK, this is actually occurring. We need to mainline such a politics into Westminster and not be preoccupied with this simplistic, stylized false choice between the Red Wall and, and Bristol. Well said, I suppose. Um, one thing I'd like to, to push you on is you, you criticise UBI quite a lot, and you mentioned Wales there. Wales recently had a UBI experiment, or about to have one. Um, many advocates of it, for example, Martin Sambu in the FT, says it gives a basic dignity to workers and it forces businesses to change. How do you think you could ever overcome that narrative that is so popular in the post-work left? Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not intrinsically against UBI. Uh, what I like is it's a massive, big, powerful idea, which has caught the imagination of many people. And I find it compelling. And I do think it goes to questions of human dignity and justice in a really profound way. And that's why it's great that it's a big idea. I simply say, and I spent quite a bit in the book, going through in some detail, a more nuanced discussion of UBI and its pros and cons. And look, look, let me give you an example, right? I don't support Milton Friedman's UBI, do you? Does anyone on this call? No, right? So the point is not whether you're for UBI or against it. It's the assumptions you're making around UBI and the politics you hold and your political philosophy. Now, you can have from any tradition of political philosophy in terms of competing theories of justice, and I go into this in the book as well, whether you're a utilitarian or um, a rights or freedom-based model of justice or a virtue-based, more Republican traditions, they, in each of those traditions, they have pros and cons for UBI, right? Similarly, on the radical left, you have for and against UBI. On the radical right, you have for and against UBI. My point is it's quite a complicated issue. It's not a silver bullet. It was seen as a silver bullet to automation before the COVID pandemic. It was seen as a, su a silver bullet to a tiny virus after COVID struck. The danger is it becomes this catch-all thing, which sort of is at the cost of thoughtful interrogation of the policy. So when people from the RSA or the SOAS guys, really good guy, who wrote the book on um, UBI and the precariat, really, you know the guy I'm talking about. He, when I hear them speak and discuss it with them, they make compelling cases for UBI, right? My point in the book is that, to me, the worst case for UBI 
is based around this technological determinism, the march of the robots, the inevitability around the end of work. That's where I start. That's where the sort of um, that's where the sort of alarm bells start ringing for me because my the deeper problem I have with the book is this post work left who used UBI um, to hide some of their assumptions around the end of work. And I think that's dangerous for labor because I could think it, if in the embrace of UBI in those terms could mean we further remove ourselves from the concerns of many, many millions of our fellow citizens who believe in dignified, purposeful work. And they will see uh, an embrace of UBI on the basis of automation as writing them off to, a, to a, an indefinite industrialized welfareism, um, which is not a good look to me. And it, UBI could become the sort of um, emblem, emblematic of the worst form of isolated passive neoliberalism. And my point is we need to have a proper discussion about it. So I have a fairly critically engaged discussion around the pros and cons of it. So it's not anti-UBI, it's anti-UBI on the terms embraced by many, including Charles Murray, you know, whoever, you know, some of the most, Milton Friedman, Richard Nixon, some other advocates of UBI who wouldn't assume are necessary bedfellows for the progressive politics in and around UBI. So it's, I think, just think it's quite a complicated, interesting debate that we should have a more thoughtful think through about it. I just want to butt in as if I could. If anyone has any questions for John, please feel free to either put them in the chat or stick your hand up and shout out. So I don't want to see me talking to John while you not watch. But you got one in the chat there if you'd like to read it, John. Oh, sorry. Am I Oh, right, someone from, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is, again, and I think it's a good question, is these binaries in terms of politics, remain, leave, age, geography, also link into, is it a question of economics or culture, right? Which is, again, another totally false choice. But in all of these things, we're played, and we're played very effectively by our opponents who want to who want us to make these choices so you know um we choose the economy look well basically it seems to me what's going to happen over the next few years is the conservatives who are changing quite dramatically will have a big economic offer they will have a very big embrace of the state and they'll wedge us open around culture wars that will be their three-pong strategy right um, we will have now a lot of the thinking about in labor for us to say, well, we can't, we, we need a big economic offer. We need a big use of the state and we can't touch the culture stuff. So we'll only talk about economics. Well, that to me is you're playing right into the hands of your opponents there. You have to contest this stuff and not get gamed out by it. So I refuse to accept that to me, the way the culture wars are played out is a further form of the underlying class battles that have always been the hallmark of politics. And I, I link it precisely to a lot of the ways that in Dagenham, um, as a colleague will know, we've had always the battleground. For, we hit the red wall 15 years before Labour hit it, right, nationally because of, we were the front line, the BNP, and from 2006, we had lots of councils on. We took them out in 2010. Nick Griffin thought he was going to win in Parliament. They thought they were going to take over the council, and they did it through a series of cultural battles against the left, partly that we were importing loads of West Africans into the borough, and that was the new Labour vote, and Labour was surrendering the working class, and we built a common politics for all races and classes locally and didn't concede this culture war. we pushed back and contested it so for example in Dagenham I would argue for the right for the for an amnesty for unregularized migrants right to reset the conversation and, and ensure that employers and politicians couldn't play fast and loose with the the least protected 
uh, the, those most demonised citizens in the local community. And people understood that if you make the case and push back and argue about it and say, look, we need to get rights for all citizens and all workers and not allow people to play one group against another. And you're being played by the right um, culturally in who are trying to, who come from, don't come from around here, who are trying to scavenge around your discontents economically and build these cultural divisions amongst us um, so that, and they think you're stupid and you can succumb to that. And people are much wiser than that and they can, um, separate out a lot of this stuff but that takes boldness around leadership um, which we need um, and you need to contest them on their own territory now there are big forces at play you've got the new gb news or whatever it's called this week you know sort of fox tv that's coming the 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 uh, popular media the broadsheet media we we don't have many um, allies there. That's why I thought it was disappointing that it looks like Labour are, are not going further around community organising, which I think has a lot of to a lot a big role to play in pushing back a lot of this stuff um, and a much more radical devolution of powers and democracy and embracing a big powerful political agenda which doesn't stop at economics. You have to contest some of this. Um, culture war stuff or you'll get gamed out by it so the first thing you do though is you don't simply try to ignore it um so i'm interested about biden i mean again he won't he's not just refusing to get entwined in this he's pushing back quite radically on questions of quality and justice which i think is good for him you know well, you your hand up. Yeah, thanks so much, Sam, for hosting. Um, congrats on your launch. Um, it's great to see the uh, University of Bristol group starting up. And thanks for coming to speak to us today, John. I really appreciate it. I've got two questions, if that's all right. I'll try and keep them quite short. Uh, my first question is about sort of what Labour as a party and a leadership should be doing in the current moment in life, some of what you've said. And the second one is more about what we can do as labour activists in our branches and in the Young Fabians. So my first question is about jobs and post-work. And these are big staples of kind of labour Twitter and intellectual circles. But we've had a lot of messaging from the Labour Party nationally over the last few years about jobs. I think we've seen jobs first Brexit, green jobs, 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 job-led recovery as slogans. But they seem quite abstract given how diverse work actually is and how diverse workers' needs are. So my question would be, how can we build a narrative and a policy agenda that makes it more tangible to most voters uh, and the different places where they work? And then my second question was picking up on what you said about community organising and also what you said about Labour drifting without debate from becoming a party for all classes and ages to becoming an overwhelmingly middle class and young one. I was wondering, do you think this is a little bit about Labour's internal culture and the fact that people who want jobs that can sustain them in the Labour movement are mocked as careerists and you're expected to maintain an incredible amount of activity in student circles, volunteer networks, etc which just isn't open to all people if you're, if you're going to get on. Um, and if that is an issue, what can we do about it practically to kind of break this back open for working class people and make our own movement more accessible? Again, these are these big questions, but I just have a sort of crack at them. Um, I take your point, you hear a lot about jobs um, and that's the strange paradox of Labour at the moment is people says there aren't any policy, but there's loads of policy always announced, right? Um, but there is no, to, to me, there is no uh, footings in the ground, really. There's no, uh, tell you what, I was involved in the 90s uh, before we won. And it was a big, long battle when I was involved in the 80s and a lot of the battles around Labour then. And um, 
I know New Labour is somewhat belittled now, but the, the central argument was around economic and social modernization of, the, of a very tired, backward country that were missing out on the global opportunities. Now, it sounds slightly odd now, but at the time it was highly contemporary, highly modern, and every element of policy was, an was anchored around this frame of economic and social modernization. You know, so we had pledge cards, we had all sorts of things, but they were all illustrative of this core fundamental story that was very simple, but took months to chisel out and develop as the sort of, as the, uh, as the fundamental framework that everyone shared across the whole movement, the membership all knew and bought into, and all policy illustrated this fundamental proposition of economic and social modernization. So the policy itself illustrated something deeper. At the moment, we've got lots of policies, but what are they illustrating? What is that fundamental shape? What is the, what is the fundamental character of labor, its sentiment? Now, what I, argue, I would argue, I do in the book, and it gets back to this culture economy thing. How you can get out of some of these traps is to return to much more fundamental questions of humanity, humanism, and human dignity, because I think that can align spiritual traditions, socialist humanist traditions, human rights traditions, all sorts into a new sort of group that gets us out of some of this factionalism. And it returns to basic questions of the lives we wish to live compared to the lives we are forced to live given the nature of modern capitalism. And consequently, that sort of analysis can give you a, a, a new politics born or grounded around questions of human dignity. It's very interesting listening to Biden uh, and some of the interviews he's given. He gave a speech in Cleveland a couple of weeks ago, gave an interview with David Brooks. He is rebuilding his whole political approach around questions of human dignity. Partly it comes from a sort of Irish Catholic American tradition, a sort of Kennedy-esque element, but that's what he was schooled in. Um, and it is grounded on a specific notion of what humans are and what they desire from their lives. Um, and that's what can create something that can unify different groups, the most diverse groups, if you assume there is a core human nature, if you want. Um, and I think you can do that. It's very difficult to do, but I think you can do that and reunite a coalition that includes um, Bristol, Central London, Dagenham, Red Bull seats, whatever. Um, but to do that, you have to get outside of these false choices. Um, but it's possible to do. Um, and that's why I, you know, that's why I like the community organizing model, actually, because it gets you out of these where new, new Labour ended up, which was a, the Labour Party became for many a conveyor belt, a sort of escalator to career advancement rather than some sort of ethical contribution to a wider sense of the common good, you know? And, um, in criticising New Labour by the end, um, the emphasis was placed on renewed forms of community organising. I really like that, both in Ed Millamet's leadership and, and um, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, actually, it's about trying to rebuild a sense of the common good in every community in Britain. Now, I think in the context of devolution, that's already starting with some of the mayoralties and some of the municipal labour initiatives where the most interesting form of labour administration is occurring in mayoralties. Uh, Bristol is a good example. Uh, Manchester and civic leadership, Preston, Salford, Dagenham, wherever. And, how, and they see, tend to be driven by a renewed sense of citizenship that unites economic and cultural concerns, where culture itself is a key economic driver, actually. So, you know, again, getting out from some of these sort of false choices, and it can rebuild the sense of the Labour Party itself as a vocation, right, rather than a career, you know, that you can join uh, as a way of contributing to that shared common good. The reason I return time and time again to this question of work and post-work and some of the assumptions around some of these debates at present is because, look, look, if you're writing off the working class, which is basically the assumption of some of the more fashionable elements in the Labour Party now, right? You shouldn't be surprised if I, they write you off. You know what I mean? If, if you don't respect and ally with 
those elements of society, why should they vote for you? If you're disrespecting them, why should you be honoured with their vote, right? And people aren't stupid. They can see what's happening here. They can see what they think the Labour Party is and who it represents and whether they like them or not, right? Because I think if you look at the modern debates in the Labour Party at times, and you might not agree with this or not, but you have to understand it, a lot of people think, well, they're not for me no more. They don't like the life I live or the life I wish to live. And therefore, you're not exactly, when the time arises, going to run around the corner and vote for them, you know? And I think this sort of should inform our diagnosis of the rise of authoritarianism. Go back to one of my initial points, the San Michael Sandel thesis is that we've lost our um, ethical character and people can see it. They can see this sort of tactical, managerial, sort of um, contractual relationship with voters and they want something deeper, especially from a party which was there born out of a moral crusade to civilise capitalism. We should return to that as our hallmark. So the organisational element is of a piece of this deeper question of ethical renewal if that makes sense. So it's a very long answer, but you know, they're very complicated questions. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks, John. Right, next up, I think Laura has a question for you, John. Hi, John. Thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, thanks to Eshan for hosting and congratulations for the launch event. Um, I was reading an interview um, that you did, John, where you talked about a documentary um, in Poland called Talking Heads, which asked people who they are and what they want. And I was thinking, how can Labour make sure that we're using the right messaging and better communications to focus on what the public actually want from a political party rather than what we think they want? Well, these are fantastic questions. I mean, um, I use this question because uh, it obsessed me. There's this little film by a Polish director called Krzysztof Kieslowski, and he, he was very famous in the 80s because he made these three colours, red, white and blue, you know, famous uh, films. But I was always quite obsessed with this little film he made called Talking Heads, which no one's ever seen. You can actually get it on the internet. Actually, if you go Kieslowski, Talking Heads, comes up this film, and basically... He goes around Poland. This is a year before Marshall Rule. And the interesting thing is it's the year before Margaret Thatcher. Really, no, it's the year before Geoffrey Howe's 1981 budget, which was the high watermark of Thatcherism or neoliberalism. So it sort of straddles changing epochs or that's right. And he goes around to these strangers, all types of society, all ages, and says three questions. Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you want from your life? Now, he was never seen as a political director, right? But I would say they are the most political questions. Who are you? What do you want from your life? Should be the foundational proposition of politics rather than, um, you know, the usual sort of transactional thing of politics where people see it as some sort of, you know, game of promising people what they think they want to hear, you know? I think the deeper question of renewal will go to the more fundamental question of the lives people wish to live compared to the ones they are having to experience. And I think the difference between those two questions, how people wish to live versus how they're having to live um, as capitalism fails to deliver in terms of housing, education, jobs, security, whatever, accounts for the rage and the anger that is driving politics and the authoritarian right can play on this much better than we can because of we've lost this ethical or moral capacity to talk about politics. To me, I use this little film as an illustration of going to those fundamental questions because <clears throat> out of this film amongst strangers come these shared themes of a life um, freed from fear, a sense of duty and obligation to your families, your neighbours, the, the links between your questions of your labour and your contribution to the common good. And I think you can build a politics out of that, right? That is the most radical of politics to make. And so I just, I, I always use it as a sort of tool about the simplicity of politics. Now, 
uh, what I would like to see, this won't happen, is for Labour or politics to simply ask those questions again. Because I think, I think this might sound crazy. Now, people say to me, yeah, well, that was before neoliberalism and people would just want to get on Love Island, right? Or they'd want to, you know, a car. And I think that is diminishing what people are. Actually, because I think deep within all of us, there is a, a sense of a life well lived or a life we wish to live. And if Labour could speak to those sort of fundamentals, that, and I think there, there's a transcendent element to that in terms of uniting people in a shared humanity. That is what humanism is, actually. Um, and that is the space for the left to rediscover that. Funnily enough, right, um, that's why I sort of raise this question of the right to work, the right to housing, education, freedom from fear, security. They're like, there is a type of politician who someone, for example, who even before he became an, M an MP, gained an international reputation for international human rights, primarily in the inhumanity of death penalty, was, was one Keir Starmer. Right? And I would think there's a natural fit there in terms of his history as a human rights advocate. The trouble is becoming a politician shrinks your you know, your, your, your vision politically, often at the expense of why you got into it. And if he could rediscover that earlier Starmer, if you want, I don't know him that well, by the way, so maybe I'm over-reading this, but that seems to me to be a really interesting question. And even framing it around a return to forms of human rights for the 2020s, um, 70 years on from the post-war human rights traditions of, you know, European conventions as we face tyranny or authoritarianism in the war period. Similarly, we face tyranny and authoritarianism now. Trump, Obama, Modi, you know, technology, author you know, te surveillance capitalism. That new frame of dignity and economic and social rights could be a, a new frame for progressive politics. Fantastic. That was a really comprehensive answer. Thanks so much, John. I should also congratulate for the first meeting. Sorry, it's uh, right. thanks, thank thanks you, for the invitation. That means a lot. Um, I don't know if you can see this, John. There's another chat from Jack, very specific to your home seat or his home seat, which is your constituency. If, if you can care to take a look, I'm sure we'll be very happy. The um, this from Jack, yeah, yeah, it's um. I'm quite interested in, um, you know, the, um, the debate in, in around Labour, especially around this lazy journalism in Westminster is who's in and out of Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet and, you know, how well is he doing and, you know, he's been in there for a year. And despite the fact, obviously, we're in a period of great benefit for incumbent governments in a successful rollout of a vaccine where well, we've all confronted death, right? So there's going to be a bit of a payoff having confronted death and then coming out um, and seeing some solid land, land around the vaccination programme and hopefully saving our lives. And the government who administers the sex for vaccination process is going to do quite well. And we're in the period, and that won't last indefinitely. But instead of that, we're locked into this Starmer top Trumps game, right? Rather than what the purpose of Labour is. And for him, it seems to me, is he's got, he's got to hold his ground um, through this pandemic dividend, if you want, vaccination dividend. Think through some of these deeper questions that might have um, enthused him before he became an MP around human rights, rethinking human rights and the common good but thirdly linking up with our most innovative pioneering councils and civic leadership because there is something cooking in labor local government i mean the mayors are really interesting really interesting Marvin ray sandy burner tracy break you know um sadiq khan they they you know they are pioneering new forms of uh egalitarian civic administration, growth models, all of that. Uh, I'm uh, embarking and dagging and we, 
I spend a lot of my time in terms of a uh, job generations where we bring in film studios, new universities, we're relocating all the great markets of central London into the borough, um, trying to trend tradition, the Ford Motor Company beyond the combustion and in, into electrical vehicles, all driven by an innovative local state, a Labour administration, building a new growth agenda. So I think, you know, if we bide our time here, not get too carried away by individual election results. Um, second, uh, rethink the essential purpose of Labour in terms of some of the things that enthused Keir Starmer before he became an MP. And third, align much more dramatically with some of the innovation around our civic leadership. And fourth, do much more analysis of what's going on in the Conservative Party, because this is not the Conservative Party of Thatcher, neoliberalism, same old Tory stuff. They, they are radically shape-shifting all the time, and we have to be much more aware of what they're doing but those four strands of a strategy could build into something quite resilient i think over time um but most importantly anchor it around some of the most innovative things in civic government there is a, a renewal of a sort of a municipal socialism occurring in very different ways around the country and it's that heterogeneity that i like it's it's different in different places you know um and barking and Dagdon, We've always been on the front line, this so-called red wall, but um, I think we'd have something to say to help that debate because we, re we are rebuilding it and we're talking about made in Dagenham again. It used to be a nostalgic thing about the 60s and 70s and forward. We're rebuilding it around modern, dignified work for local residents. Right, I think we've got time for one last question. Um, Marie Hill, I think we should be here. Marie, make it a good one. Thank you. It's been really interesting. Um, my question is about like um, the Labour Party appealing to the working class. Um, I I think like I've heard a lot recently that um, they are like struggling to appeal to work, uh, to relate to the working class. But my question is like when you say there's like building a coalition of people and like there's quite a big like the, the whole the concept of working class has changed and I think a lot of people are kind of like middle class now how can the Labour Party appeal to like like a coalition of people from different classes but also how can how can the Labour can do you think that um the party can can represent the working class um does it have to do you think it needs the leader to be like currently working class for them to be able to do that? Or how do they do it without? Here's the thing, right? Um, sorry, that's my printer going down there. For example. Sorry about that. Um, you know what I said about Keir Starmer? The, the case for Keir Starmer seems to me is never made properly, right? Um, I would say, if you wanted to rebuild a politics around questions of human dignity, right, the dignity of work, um, genuine equality of all human beings and citizens, um, the right to a free education and health, to live in a country that's not being degraded by the hour, um, to upgrade human rights commensurate with 2020s, right? sort of politician you'd want would be someone who gained an international reputation as a pioneering human rights lawyer before he became an MP. That's what enthused him. But second, right, if I look, I look at Keith Starmer and I see him as the son of a toolmaker and a nurse, right, who was the first in his, US, first in his family to go to university, right? Um, I'm the same age as him and I was the same. So I think that is a real story of social mobility amongst a generation. Um, whose parents come out of the war, you know, who lived through, were part of that massive post-war social experiment, economic and social changes of pioneering Labour governments. And we were the sort of outcomes of all of that. And those, those changes have stopped. So those forms of social mobility have gone backwards now, right? Um, so he, almost more than anyone, it seems to me, is, and he's palpably not in it for the money, 
because he's you know he shows that in terms of some of the debates around procurement and contracting and all of that um he has a forensic mind he's very good technically in terms of that politics you would you think there's a very strong sort of um person specification there for a labor leader that he fulfills and i don't quite know why there's that sort of misfiring between his ratings and those qualities that he holds um, which I think were pretty transparent when he first got the job. And he managed to reunite all sorts of sections of the party in support of him. So I think there's something there, right? And it just hasn't quite worked yet. Now, I do continue to emphasise the fact that we are in this middle of this pandemic vaccination rollout, which will create some sort of um, political premium and it is doing in Wales, it's doing around the globe actually to those countries that are um, on the front line of the vaccination system and even amongst civic leaders who have been trying delivering locally. So I wouldn't get too carried away with the day-to-day -day polling. If I was the leader of his team, I'd be working to ensure that they can transition out of this vaccination period with a deeper compelling message about who he is what enthuses him, his own backstory, which I think is a compelling one, and um, link it into a deeper story of who and what the country can be in terms of questions of social mobility and modern citizenship, and go back to this question of what people want from their lives, because that should be the key driver of politics. And when you say that, people say, well, you can't talk about some of those deeper questions. And I find that odd because in any family, I oh know that's what drives a lot of the conversations of these deeper questions around the purpose of people's lives. They don't mind not say it like that, but you know it and you can um, feel it in conversations with them. Uh, and it's only politicians that can speak to some of those deeper sentiments that can really capture the notion of the imagination. I don't think Boris Johnson captures that deeper sense of the national character or desires of where we want to be. I mean, he's sort of bluster mixed with a bit of delivery in the vaccine, which will have a certain shelf life. And the question is, do we have the wherewithal? Are we too emptied out to have the political resources to get out from under our current dilemmas? Because I do see some, and I do return to this question of Biden, what he's done. Someone like Starmer could drive forward a progressive agenda that is beyond both new labor and Corbynism and we'll weave together some of the better elements of both in terms of a new public philosophy for the left um, so that's why I urge you to stay involved keep working hard because that notion of the wider common good I think you know will infuse a deeper politics as we move forward and I just keep return back to this when people have confronted that question of their lives ending, it does serve to rethink the purpose of our lives going forward. And that creates opportunities for politics. It creates opportunities for some bad politics as well as good, but that's why it's incumbent on us to try and contest political spaces. And the reason why I wrote the book, bottom line is, rather than to see anything as inevitable or the product of deterministic technological demographic forces or even political forces is to say that these are political debates and contested terrain and not to vacate them but to engage them to try and shape them for the future well i think everyone here has thoroughly enjoyed your very long and extremely interesting questions <laughs> and answers should i say um they have been amazing especially considering you are someone who's been hidden away from the front bench for quite a while now. I feel like a lot of us here have really understood what you are putting forward and I feel like you should be up in the front of the Labour Party, I think. Things aren't that bad. Right. Um, I was going to thank everyone for coming to join um, us for our first event and most importantly, thank you all for taking time out of this out of the sun to come and join us as well. I'd like to wish everyone a good evening. And thanks for having me and good luck to you all and going forward right. in your future work. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all that, guys.